Hi guys. Here we are again. Um, first, a few um, items of business. If you cannot hear me, if you stop being able to see me, would somebody please either call one of my phones or text me and clue me in so I can fix whatever the problem is. Um, it, all of you are watching now. Obviously, it's Tuesday. I might have students that watch this later this week. So <clears throat> roads are really bad again. Um, and I, worrying schools are closed. My driveway and my road is ice. <sighs> so here we are. I have a lot of things I wanted to show you in person. Um, I promise I will bring all of them. Um, you know, it's supposed to be 50 degrees next week. So presumably we will see each other next week. Um, I had some artwork to show you. I'm going to do the best I can, but um, the things I wanted to show you in person, I will bring you. Um, and I had a handout for you. Um, if you're having trouble keeping up with anything, if you don't understand any of the instructions, please call me, email me um, this afternoon, tomorrow. Um, we can talk on the phone. I can get you um, on the right track. Uh, otherwise, we will dive in. Uh, make sure you have your reading guide right now. If you don't have it and something to write with, please run and get those. Um, I think that's all I need you. You can have your books with you, but um, not necessary. Uh, but your reading guide and, and something to write with. Um, and uh, let's just chat for another minute or so just as people are logging in. Um, to make sure everybody's here. We're going to talk about your papers. First of all, hopefully, <clears throat> everyone was able to think of three, well, first of all, everyone was able to pick a side. I want, I would love to have lived in the Middle Ages. I would hate to have lived in the Middle Ages. So you've chosen a side. And then you've thought of three, um, what it was calling umbrella reasons, L large reasons. Uh, and, and then three supports for each of those. And I asked you to write those up in three paragraphs, all right? If you had any trouble getting to that point, please let me know so that I can help you along. Um, but uh, if I don't hear from you, I'm going to assume that you were able to do this. So I'm going to ask you to do basically three things. I, I was hoping to edit your papers. Some of you handwrite your papers, so it's not easy for you to, to send them to me. You'd have to scan them. So we're just going to have to work with what we've got. Um, so why don't you hold on to those? Although I'm just going to warn you that there may be, I may edit them and ask you to do a little bit of rewriting. Okay. Um, today we're going to um, talk about what goes into an introduction and a conclusion. And I'm going to have you add something to the body. Um, well, actually, I'm going to have you add several things. I'm going to ask you to look for a places where you could put both your parallelisms and your strong verb. So you're going to do a little bit of editing on your own of the three body paragraphs you wrote. Let's actually start with that. So, Said, like I said, hopefully you all have three paragraphs written on a piece of paper. And each one describes a reason you would want to live in the Middle Ages, you would not want to live in the Middle Ages. And each of those reasons has three supports, three reasons why your big reason is valid. All right? Do you all remember our parallelism? I'm going to review those um, just in case they have slipped your mind because it's been a while since we've done a writing project. So parallelism one was using three of the same type of word. For example, three adjectives, three adverbs, three verbs. Um, so for example, um, my roads were slick, icy, and treacherous. Well, there's three adjectives, slick, icy, treacherous. That's a parallelism. I slid, careened, and fell on the ice in my driveway. Slid, careened, and, and fell. Three verbs. It snowed heavily, 
fiercely and depressingly. Those would be three adverbs. So that's parallelism one. I would like you to go back to your three paragraphs and find a place where you could put in parallelism with words, okay? Parallelism two, it's a little trickier. It was with phrases or clauses. Phrases are easily easy. The, the most popular phrase we have in English is a prepositional phrase. So we could say, I slid past the door, across the driveway, and into a snowbank. And that would be three prepositional phrases. Uh, many of you were doing prepositional phrases, and you were doing great with your parallelism back seems like so long ago, um, back before Christmas. Uh, we can do clauses. Remember, clauses have a subject and a verb. Sometimes the subject is, is understood. Um, uh, it's, it's not written, actually, every single clause. Um, sometimes it's present. So let me give you an example. Um, the snow fell on the roads, blocked the traffic, and caused many accidents. Now I have three clauses, so to speak. The, the word snow is the subject of all of those. I just didn't write snow every time because that would be repetitive. The snow fell on the yards. The snow fell on the roads. I don't even remember what I said now. Um, here's another example. When it's cold and icy outside. When chill winds are blowing ice crystals into your face, and when the roads are impassable, it is a lovely thing to sit at home and drink cocoa. Now I have three when clauses. I We've talked about this numerous times. If you have any questions about that whatsoever, please, please contact me and I will give you more examples. So I would like you to look in your paper and see somewhere else where you could put a parallelism to. So now we have three, somewhere where you have three of the same sort of word, three verbs, adjectives, adverbs, whatever, and three phrases or clauses somewhere, all right? Also, we were using the strong verb. Remember, a strong verb simply means a verb that's more descriptive. So, for example, I fell on the ice. Uh, all right, that's that's okay. That's not bad. But um, I tumbled on the ice. That that gives me an an image of being just completely out of control. I can see your arms and legs waving wildly while you're trying to save yourself from slipping. Um, I <laughs> wiped out. Uh, that's that's a verb and an adverb, <clears throat> but we usually use them together. And, uh, and that's pretty descriptive too. It means it was pretty spectacular. A wipeout is pretty spectacular fall. Um, the, the examples I used are um, uh, said, have, um, walk. Uh, these are all uh, sort of humdrum verbs. They're grammatically correct. They're just a little humdrum. So see if you can find a verb somewhere in the three paragraphs that you've written that's just not as descriptive as it could be. And see if you can find another verb that is more precisely describing what you want to communicate. All right. So you might be talking about a tournament and and the knights uh, the, the knight sometimes falls from his horse. What does he do? Does he tumble? Does he wipe out? Does he you can you can substitute? So we're looking for those things. We are adding a new one because you guys have been so great with um, in the fall with those three. I think it's time for a new one. We are adding the simile. 
Now, I really wanted to be together to do this, and maybe we'll do some uh, examples next week when we're together. I'd like to get some feedback from you. Um, a simile is when we compare two things um, using like or as. We say one thing was like another, or one thing was as something as another. The sun was as bright as, well, let's do it the other way. The, um, the polished dishes were as bright as the sun. You know, that I'm describing the polished dishes, uh, comparing them to the sun. Here's the trick about similes. We don't want to compare two things that are exactly the same. My, my beagle was like a basset hound. No, no, they're, they're practically, I know they're not practically the same thing, but they're close enough. Um, my beagle was like the faithful follower of a king. Now you're the king or queen, and the beagle is is your faithful. Is, my, my beagle was like a like a medieval vassal. All right, what does he owe you? He owes you love, right, and tail wags. There's no other way. Your dog is like a medieval vassal or the follower of a king. He doesn't wear armor. I'm assuming. He doesn't, uh, you know, go to war. What does he do? He follows you. He He's always ready to do what you want done, right? There's, so there's only one way they're together, uh, one way they're similar. We don't want to compare things that are exactly the same. So, you know, my sweater is as soft as a cloud. Technically, I don't know how soft clouds are, but uh, what ways is my sweater like a cloud? It is not white. It does not rain. It does not blow away with the wind. This is good. It is just simply soft. All right. We could say oh, it soft as a cotton ball or something like that. Something soft. <clears throat> but we wouldn't say this sweater is as soft as my sweatshirt. Your sweater and your sweatshirt are practically the same thing. It's tricky. So I would like you to look at what you've already written and see if there's somewhere you can put in a simile. Can you compare a night jousting to um, oh, the jousting knights were like two lions fighting over uh, domination of the pride. All right. How are they like lions? They're fierce. Do they have manes? No. Do they have fur? No. Do the knights have claws? No. But the fierceness with which they fight is like two lions fighting over command of the pride. Do you see? So don't worry. Get, try it. If you haven't done these before, don't worry. You know, your first ones may not be the best simile ever written. None of the ones I just said are the best ones ever made up. I was just making them up on the fly. Good, good writers can use similes to sort of show you more about the topic. Um, if they wanted to open up jousts being like, uh, uh, jousting nights being like wild animals, you know, because they thought it was terrible a terrible practice and they, they want to discourage jousting, although I haven't seen many jousts lately. <clears throat> and they might describe them as being like wild animals in a way that makes you feel negative ab about it. On the other hand, lions are awesome. And they might use that because they want it to seem noble because lions are the king of the beasts. So sometimes they're not random. It's, <clears throat> it's not always just let me think of something this could be like. As we get better at using them, we actually use them to reveal something about, um, about the story, about the character, about the setting, okay? So see if you can take something in your three paragraphs and compare it to something else using like or as. 
And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be together next week and we can go over those together. Um, now let's talk about introductions and conclusions. So grab your reading guide. Find, find a blank page at, somewhere near this week's reading questions. I also want you to write this week an introduction and a conclusion. So I'm going to stand up here, do my whiteboard. I'm sorry. This is a very, I have a narrow, I have a very narrow place to stand here. Okay. So some of you have done this before with me. Some of you, this is brand new, but um, you know, we can all use a review. Um, so the reason we add an introduction and a conclusion is this. If somebody were to pick up your paper and they just, the first sentence was, I would hate to live in the Middle Ages because it was smelly, dirty, and 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 uh, full of illness. Ooh, and that's a parallelism. That would be a very abrupt way to start your paper. I I picked up your paper. It's not me, okay? It's just some random person reading your paper, and I didn't even know what it was about. And suddenly, I just got hit with your first topic sentence. It's nice to ease our reader into our paper, right? Tell them, what is this paper going to be about? Is this something the, the reader wants to read? Okay, so let's jot down things that should be in an introduction. An introduction is simply a short beginning paragraph. Introduction. Last week, I was told my writing was right side uh, for you guys. Oh, I see it very well. Okay. First, we try to catch the reader's attention. All right. Um, so we can do this in various ways, uh, but why do we want to do it at all? because we want them to read it. You know, I will read it. I told you to write this paper, and so no matter how it starts, I will read it. But if you were writing an article for a magazine or a newspaper, you know, you want people to, to read it. That's the purpose of writing, to communicate. And so we're not communicating if the person doesn't read what we wrote. So we would like them to read it. How do we convince them? That they should read it. We grab their attention. We get them invested and involved as soon as possible. There are some ways to do this. First of all, we could ask a question. Now, if I say I wanted to live in the Middle Ages, okay, that's the side I chose, I might ask my reader a question like this. Wouldn't it be amazing to live in a time of castles, beautiful damsels, and strong knights? Oh, and there's another parallelism. Now, they're not going to answer you. This is a what they call a rhetorical question. But it gets your reader thinking, right? Um, it makes them think, oh, yes, I would. Tell me more, please, about these castles and damsels and knights. Conversely, if you chose, I would not ever in a million years want to live in the Middle Ages, you might start your, your introduction with, who would want to go back to a time when large sections of the population died of disease because there were no treatments available? Or, Aren't you glad you live in modern times when antibiotics are easily accessible and we have hospitals in every city? Well, now obviously one of your points is going to be, I don't want to live there because medical care was so bad, All right? So a question can get people engaged because when you ask me a question, even if I don't physically answer it, I think it. I think it, and you've got me engaged, okay? Another way to um, uh, 
capture your reader's attention is to give them a command. All right, this is very similar to the question. So instead of um, asking who would want to live in a time when so many people died of disease, you might say, imagine, imagine that you are sick with a minor illness and there is no hope for you. There is no treatment because doctors don't know what to do. See, I've given you a command. Imagine. Uh, related to this is starting with um, an, what is called an anecdote. Anecdote. This is kind of fun and it's kind of related to the command. Uh, it's a short story, and I mean short. Don't write an entire several paragraph story to be your introduction, unless you're writing a really, really long paper. You know, if it's a 10 or 20 page paper, we might be able to do that. Not for this paper, not for a short essay. Um, so I might tell you the story. I'm going to go on this medical care theme. Um, I might tell you the story of little um, little um, Jonathan who uh, fell down playing with his friends and scraped his knee open on a rock, but it got infected and little Jonathan died. This is a terrible story. But it was a story that really happened. I mean, I don't know about Jonathan falling and, and, and scratching his knee, but people died of infection. Prior to the uh, advent of antibiotics, infections killed you. And now you go to the doctor and he gives you a bottle of pills and he says, take these for 10 days, you're fine. And in most cases you are. Many of us have had some wound that got infected. We're fine. We're still alive. So you tell this little story. And what does this do? It tugs at their heartstrings, doesn't it? Remember last week I told you um, there are various ways to uh, persuade someone and that we were going to really mostly focus on logical arguments. But there was another way uh, appealing to people's emotions, what they call pathos, what Aristotle called pathos appealing to people's emotions. Your little story can do that. Uh, or you could tell the story of, you know, a brave knight who won renown um, and saved his, uh, saved his village, whatever. If it's from a dragon, it, depending on whether dragons really existed, this could end up being fictional, but you get my point. Um, to play up this, this knight's courage. And then you can swing into one of your reasons is it was a time of nobility and courage. That's why you want to live there. So a short story, we're talking two or three sentences, all right, um, can really engage your reader. Last one, this is hard, nah, but I'll tell it to you because you might want to try it. It's use a quotation, all right? So you can <clears throat> look for a quote about your topic. So you might try to find a quote about the nobility of the Middle Ages, if that's the direction you've gone. Conversely, you could find a quote about the squalor or unpleasantness of the Middle Ages. Um, it could be out of one of the books we're reading. It could be out of the Chaucer storybook or something like this. But you see, it's harder because you've got to find the quote. Most of us don't have an arsenal of quotes just at our disposal that we can think of immediately and pull out. Uh, so it, it takes a little more doing. Um, usually have to consult some sort of source. Um, nowadays, it's often online. Um, you guys know I don't love <clears throat> online research, but often we have there are books of uh, quotes divided by topic, um, which you may or may not have in your house. Uh, but that one's harder. Don't do all of these. Just choose one. All right? This is the first element in an introduction. Second of all, you need to state the subject. State 
the subject of your paper so that your reader knows what we're talking about. The Middle Ages would be a glorious time to have lived. Or the Middle Ages would have been a horrendous time to have lived. Now I know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. I also know your position. Are you pro life in the Middle Ages or anti life in the Middle Ages? Okay. Then the last thing I want you to do in your introduction is state your three reasons. Whatever your three umbrella reasons are for choosing the side you've chosen, I want you to tell me, all right? This is the point when I would say, are there any questions? You can't ask them. So I will say, if there are any questions, please, you know, later this afternoon after I'm done teaching, you know, call or email. I will um, answer any questions, okay? So your first task is I want you to write an introduction for the paper that you wrote the three paragraphs for last week, right? We're also going to add a conclusion. Conclusions do the opposite. An introduction eases you into the paper. A conclusion eases you out of the paper so that uh, it doesn't stop abruptly. It's just with your last reason. So conclusion. Conclusion is a little less complicated, but there's one element that can be kind of hard. First of all, I want you to restate your position and your three reasons. So you told me your three reasons in the introduction. Then your paragraphs told me your three reasons in three paragraphs. And then your conclusion is going to tell me your reasons again. Why so many times? Well, Andrew Pudua, the IEW guy, um, says that we're not very, um, most of us don't remember things real great when we're told something. So if you want someone to remember what you say, tell them what you're going to tell them. And then tell them. And then tell them what you told them. And now they've heard it three times, and the likelihood of what you said sticking in their memory is going to be much higher. All right? Now, second thing, this is the kind of hard one. Um, which reason is most, um, most important? And why? Why is it significant? This is the kind of who cares. <laughs> I call it the who cares. So perhaps one of my reasons for not wanting to live in the Middle Ages was the the medical care that we've been talking about. And to me, see, this is your opinion, which one is most important. To me, that's the, that's the kicker. I could live with um, wars could live with, you know, um, bad living conditions, cold, you know, hovels or uh, cold castles, dark, this sort of thing. But it's the medical care that gets me. And I might say something like, uh, uh, while, while poor living conditions and uh, constant warfare are problems in any age. The most pivotal reason that no one should want to live in the Middle Ages was their lack of um, effective medical care. Because when you don't have your health, everything else is miserable. See, I've, I've, I've told you why, why do I think health care? Why do I think medicine is pivotal? Because, you know, when you're ill, or frankly, when you're dead, you can't really do much of anything anymore. Um, but when you're ill, everything is is difficult. Um, 
you know, my, my, at my church, uh, the reading last week was about the, um, the 10 lepers that were healed by Jesus. And, and only one of them came back to say, thank you. And, um, and, uh, the, the sermon was about in the sermon, they mentioned, um, that leprosy, uh, there are several hundred cases of leprosy in the U S every year. It's highly treatable with just like an antibiotic cocktail, a mix of antibiotics. People do not die of leprosy anymore. People's body parts don't fall off like they used to. You're not shunned for life. Um, so imagine living in a time when that was so. So anyway, th this, this could be your reason to say, for me, this is the most pivotal reason I wouldn't want to live there. All right. And then the last, this is basically um, a single sentence wrap up. As you can see, the Middle Ages were a terrible time to be alive. Or, as you can see, or all of the above points show that the Middle Ages were glorious and we all miss out by not experiencing them. It's a wrap up. It's a closure, right? When I hit a sentence that looks like that, I know that this paper is done. And it eases me out of it, okay? Again, this is the place where I would say, are there any questions? If there are, call me or email me later, okay? Um, so what I want you to do this week, let's just recap before we move on while I get myself out of my conundrum here. Um, look, Take a look at the three paragraphs that you wrote for me uh, last week. See if you can put your parallelisms and your strong verb in and see if you can add a simile and then write an introduction and a conclusion. I would like you to bring all of that to me next week. Now, it does not have to be in perfect, polished, finished form if you're handwriting, because I would like to edit it and then have you do a final draft after I've edited it, okay? While we get ready for our next paper. Okay, so bring it to me. But if you have, for example, Maybe your three body paragraphs are in in one paper and you've crossed out things and you've stuck in your parallelism. This is fine. Uh, and maybe your introduction and conclusion are a separate piece of paper. This is fine. Because I want to edit and say, you've forgotten to put this in. Or why don't you try that? And then I'm going to have you write a final, nicely put together final draft. All right? Um, okay. That's it for your writing. Like I said, any questions, contact me. Let's move ahead to what you read um, in our new Dorothy Mills book. Go ahead and get your reading questions out. Um, these are on page 41. And uh, I had to read chapter one and part of chapter two. Chapter two is very long, as you can see. Chapter one really was a uh, summary of what we covered first semester. It was a summary of um, last week's class, honestly. Because as we said, one time period doesn't just end suddenly and a new one begin. You don't go to bed uh, one night and it's the Middle Ages and then when you wake up in the morning, it's, uh, it's the Renaissance. These things happen over sometimes hundreds of years, certainly decades, all right? Um, uh, and, and so in the, chapter one, Dorothy Mills went over, uh, some of the things that changed. I, I phrased it list three, oh, I'm sorry, list five changes in attitude or politics that swept across, um, Europe in the 14th through 16th centuries. What years is that? When is the 14th century? Remember, it's the 1300s. The 16th century is the 
hundreds. We're in the 21st century, so we're in the 20s. Why is it always one behind? Because the years one to 99 are the first century. And you see none of those, like the year 76, it has no one in front of it, but it's the first century. Then 100 to 199 is the second century, and here we go. The, the number that we call the century is always one above the number that's at the beginning of the years of that century. Okay, so this, is, this means between the 1300s and 1500s. All right, what changed? I went through the Dorothy Mills book, and I jotted down these, these are some things that I got from my answers. On page five, uh, well, page five, if your book looks like mine, so I don't know. Um, as a result of the weakening of imperial rule, the Holy Roman Empire was on the way down. The vision of empire was giving way to the idea of smaller nationalities. You know, this we, we talked about England and France and not so much about Spain. If you've wondered why we didn't talk a lot about Spain, you might remember that Spain was taken over by the Muslims, right? Pretty early on in the, by the year 700. And they mm, weren't as much a part of European history. Um, all right, hang on. I'm going to check my text to make sure that it's not saying you can't hear me. Oh, no, we're, we're good. All right. Uh, but we, we talked about various nations, but the overarching power was the Holy Roman Empire. This is, uh, this is uh, what is today, Germany, Austria, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, part of France, um, Switzerland, part of Northern Italy, uh, huge, huge power. But many people didn't think of themselves as this particular nationality. They thought of themselves as just part of Christendom, part of the church. Obviously, England versus France started breaking that apart. But remember, we're talking about 1300s to 1500s, 1300s is when England and France are fighting. So, and, and 1400s, early 1400s. So, you know, when you're, it's us against them, English versus French, you start thinking, we're, we're a unit, we're Englishmen, or we're the French, by golly, and we hate those Englishmen. Instead of thinking, but we're all Christians. We're all part of this big thing called Christendom. Mm -hmm. We're starting to think of ourselves as individual nations. This is one change, one shift. Okay, the second one I noted, well, I also noted gunpowder. We talked about that last week. Um, when men began questioning the rightness of the temporal interests of the papacy, they soon began thinking of its teaching and asking for a return to a Christianity free from the tangles and intrigues of worldly affairs. What does this mean? The temporal interests of the papacy. The papacy is the Pope. Temporal comes from the word Latin word for time. And the time means the time here on earth. Temporal means earthly, worldly. The church owned land, right? The church had vassals the church was sort of a political mover and a shaker. And people started saying, mm, I don't know if it's supposed to be that. I don't think that's its job. Not to mention, like we talked about last week, when I start thinking of myself as an Englishman or a Frenchman, I start to not be real wild about supporting something that's not English or not French. It separates me from it. Okay. A third one uh, I wrote noted that she mentioned is the invention of printing. We're going to talk about that a little more uh, later in the semester. But uh, if you have something to say, like Wycliffe, mm -hmm, about the church being good or bad, 
about England or France being good or bad. If you live in a time when every single book or um, flyer, do you know what I mean? Like the papers that people put up on bulletin boards and, and telephone poles and stuff for advertisements. You have to write each of those out by hand. You're not going to get very many of them written out. If you can print them on a machine, if you can print a thousand of them, if you can print 10,000 of them and distribute them, people are going to know fast what you think and you can mobilize people quickly. It changes. It really changes things. Not to mention, she said it changed education. When I can get my hands on a book that doesn't cost, I don't know, half a year's wages, you know, the faster we can print them, the more we can print them, the more common they are, the more common something is, the cheaper it gets. I'm more likely to, to learn to read or teach, have my children learn to read because there's stuff for them to read. Not to mention that there are more books for school children. There are more books available for them to learn to read from. Okay, so that was huge. Um, the next one I marked was, um, goes along with the first one, Im growing sense of the importance of the individual and of the national state. And men began to write more in their own languages, in English, French, Italian, and Spanish. Not only am I thinking of myself as an Englishman, but I'm thinking of myself as an individual in England. Um, not just part of, uh, I don't want to say, like a cog in the wheel. The medieval feudal system was lovely in some ways because everybody knew where they belonged. Everybody knew I'm a vassal. Um, these people are vassals to me. I'm a vassal to this person. I know where I fit in. That's kind of crumbling apart now. And people start to look at themselves and say, you know, I'm not just a, a link in a chain. I am not just a cog in a machine. I'm an individual with hopes and dreams and aspirations. And, uh, and as people, as authors and poets, start writing in the language you can read, because maybe you haven't been to school and you haven't learned to read Latin. Latin was still the the language, the going language of, of um, people who wrote acad on academic subjects and literature. But as more is available, you know, and, and, and this literature or poetry starts to feed that sense of, but I'm an individual. What about me as a person? Maybe my goal in life isn't to be a vassal to this person. Maybe I have another goal. All right, the next one I marked is, this is huge, we will talk about this more uh, later this semester, discovery of the new world, discovery of the Americas. Now, you just cannot, I don't think we can even imagine the importance of this for, <clears throat> for the mindset of Europe. They didn't know. There were people on the other side of the world. And people living very differently. They knew about Africa, but only Northern Africa, right? Pretty much because um, the Sahara Desert keeps you from traveling south by land. And until uh, the 1400s, there wasn't a lot of exploration down the coast of Africa and around the bottom of Africa. They didn't really know what was there. They didn't know how far south it went. But they knew there was a, a landmass there, and they called it Africa. They just, it was unknown to the south. Asia, they know. We talked about Marco Polo. People had traveled. People had been coming from uh, Asia for centuries. You know, the barbarian tribes all came from that direction. And, of course, Europe. And for a long time um, in the Middle Ages, they really thought there was no land on the other side of the world, that it was all ocean. But when they discovered not only is there land over there, but it is peopled by people that, that speak different languages and live, like I said, exceedingly different types of life than everyone around the Mediterranean. This was mind blowing. Um, so we will, we will touch on that more, um, 
not only was it, it, it changed their mindset, but they started importing things from the new world, right? Um, not only ideas, but actual items, food items, and we'll cover that more in a few weeks. Uh, the next thing I marked was, I already mentioned printing was invented. And uh, here's what Dorothy Mills says. I'll just read her. In 1453, Constantinople, which for a thousand years had stood as a bulwark against invaders from the east, fell into the hands of the Turks, and scholars and artists came fleeing into Western Europe, bringing with them manuscripts and a knowledge of Greek, which opened up new realms of thought to the men of the West. All right. Do you remember that way back in August, September, we talked about the fact that the Roman Empire fell apart, but only the Western Roman Empire. For another thousand years, there was a Roman emperor in Constantinople. He called himself the Roman emperor. They called themselves Romans. The people in Turkey, the people in Greece, they called themselves Romans. But in 1453, <clears throat> the, the Turks, another group of people who came from the East, had um, encircled Constantinople, and that empire had been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking for some time until they finally took the city. A thousand years after the after Rome basically had fallen to um, Goths, and when they did, when they when the people in Constantinople and the surrounding areas that were getting swallowed up knew what was happening, they grabbed everything they could and they hightailed it west. They grabbed books, they grabbed pictures, they grabbed all their belongings. They brought those, but they brought something even more spectacular and that was knowledge of the Greek language. Almost no one in the west could read Greek and many uh, much Greek literature, like most of Plato, Aristotle, it hadn't been translated into Latin. Uh, all the other philosophers, the literature, they didn't have Homer in Greek. They didn't have the Iliad and the Odyssey in Greek. They had bits of it, but they didn't have the whole thing. And so these, these people came and they offered to teach people Greek. And uh, as a matter of fact, um, I'm going to go, uh, your second chapter talked about Renaissance Italy. Let me read this uh, section. Uh, this is a, um, a, a man who lived in Florence. Uh, um, what is it? Bruni. Bruni. What is his first name? Why can I not find it? All right, I can't find um, the rest of his name. Uh, he wrote in the history of his own times in Italy. He said this, then first came a knowledge of Greek, which had not been in use among us for 700 years. Chrysoloras, the Byzantine, Constantinopolitan, uh, a man of noble birth and well-versed in Greek letters brought Greek learning to us. When his country was invaded by the Turks, he came by sea first to Venice. The report of him soon spread, and he was cordially invited and besought and promised a public stipend to come to Florence and open his store of riches to the youth. I was then studying civil law, but I burned with love of academic studies and had spent no little pains on dialectic and rhetoric. Dialectic is a, is a form of logic. At the coming of Chrysoloras, I was torn in mind, deeming it shameful to desert the law, and yet a crime to lose such a chance of studying Greek literature. And often with youthful impulse, I would say to myself, thou, when it is permitted thee to gaze on Homer, Plato, and Demosthenes, and the other poets, philosophers, orators, of whom such glorious things are spread abroad, and speak with them, and be instructed in their admirable teaching, wilt thou desert and rob thyself? Wilt thou neglect this opportunity so divinely offered? For 700 years, no one in Italy has possessed Greek letters, and yet we confess that all knowledge is derived from them. How great advantage to your knowledge 
enhancement of your fame, increase of your pleasure will come from an understanding of the tongue. There are doctors of civil law everywhere, and the chance of learning will not fail thee. But if this one and only doctor of Greek letters disappears, no one can be found to teach thee. Overcome at le length by these reasons, I gave myself to Chrysoloras with such zeal to learn that what through the wakeful day I gathered, I followed after in the night, even when asleep. Thought about Greek in his sleep. He was so eager to learn it. This was huge for Europe when these people came from Constantinople and they said, I can teach you Greek. And I have Greek books that you've never read. You've only heard about. All right. Um, those were six. I asked you for five. Those were six things I found. Perhaps you found something I didn't. Um, but uh, that gives you an idea, um, again, of the way things were changing. Um, chapter two, uh, this book is organized in such a way that it visits different countries because they're all starting to take their own uh, routes and have their own history. Uh, just like they said in the first chapter that nations... The idea of nationality was arising. So um, chapter two is about Italy, and in particular, Florence. Why Florence? Florence was a hotbed of art and literature. Um, some of the greatest talents and minds lived in Florence. Some of the most famous people were from Florence. Um, but so Florence is a snapshot of what many Italian cities were like. Only Florence was the one of the most renowned for those things I just mentioned. And I asked you, how was Italy organized in the 15th century? Italy, Dorothy Mills tells us, was made up of very different kinds of states. Italy was not a country. Italy. That didn't happen until fairly recently. Italy was a bunch of smaller city-states. So some of you who took Greece and Rome with me last year may remember we talked about uh, Greece also wasn't united. Uh, Greece was Thebes and Athens and Corinth and Sparta. And they all had their own rulers and their own money and their own laws. They were separate from each other. Italy was like that. So Florence wasn't just a, an Italian city. It was a sovereign state. Venice was its own state. Um, Fisoli and Pistoia and uh, all these Italian cities were their own states. Um, Milan. Um, and I asked you what family, unofficially, without any political office, ruled Florence. This was the... Medici family. The Medicis were bankers. The Medicis were just wealthy, um, well-known citizens of Italy. But through, uh, I don't know, deals under the table. Do you know what I mean? Um, sort of in private arrangements with other people in private that they might lend money to the government, that they might put their stamp of approval on certain laws. They sort of took over. They are known for being unscrupulous, which means they will do anything to make what they want happen, even if it's not legal or moral. They weren't all horrible, but... <clears throat> A lot of them were. There, there was, yeah. The Medicis were up to no good a good lot of the time. Um, Lorenzo the Magnificent, Lorenzo de' Medici, um, was the uh, most well-known. Uh, Dorothy Mills says, uh, the Medicis were recognized as the supreme power in the state and as the equals of kings and princes. Um, there were several Medici popes. This was back in a time when to become pope, you just really needed, it was like an election, like a political election today. You know, you need, if you get enough votes, if you get enough support, you're in. And the Medicis had, had the connections and they had the pull. 
so they could get family members pope it made pope unfortunately the the family member might not necessarily care anything about the church which is another reason why people started looking at the church and saying what should this person be in charge of an institution founded by god for the spiritual good of of people i don't know um I actually have, let's see if I want to do this now. Yeah, let's do this. Um, I have pictures. I'm going to hold them up in front of the camera, but I think I will probably bring um, bring these to class next week. Um, this is Florence. This is a picture of, of the cathedral in Florence today. Isn't it absolutely gorgeous? Um, some of this, parts of this building go back to the 1300s. It's been added on and, and, you know, renovated. I really hope I get to go see this in person someday. Florence is on my must stop list if I ever get to go to Italy. Um, and in uh, Italy, we're going to talk, in Florence, we're going to talk about some of the artists and writers and thinkers um, that you read about. Um, one of them, uh, well, actually, you're going to read about the artists this next week. All right. You're going to read about a bunch of artists. And for the next few weeks, I'm going to bring in samples of their art for you to look at. Um, one artist you're going to read about, I will read, bring some more of him, is named Botticelli. Sandra Botticelli was from Florence. And um, I, I brought in a couple of pictures. Uh, he, he did a lot of, um, he did religious paintings. He did paintings uh, based on paganism, like, a, you know, mythological personages. Uh, but he also did um, just portraits. And here are two. These are young young men from Florence. We do not know who they are. Let me see. So, two young men from Florence. And the next one. Okay. This guy. I don't know, not the best looking guy. I don't know what else to say. Also, rather snooty looking. But he is Giuliano de' Medici. He is a member of the Medici family that's set for a portrait by Botticelli. Here we are. Don't worry about the um, the one on this side. It's, it's this guy. All right. I love the way he's sort of looking down his nose at something. You know, the way you would look if you were very smug and you thought you were better than other people. That's what I get from this portrait. And, you know, Botticelli had all sorts of options about how to paint this guy. And he painted him looking down his nose like he's better than everybody else because maybe that's what he was like. Could be. Um, so look for the name Botticelli. Um, in your reading for next week, uh, but uh, these are these are this is one of the Medici family there, and um, and a couple of young men, probably Florentines, because that's where Botticelli was painting. Um, okay, another very very famous person from uh, Florence. Well, there were, there were two, um, Petrarch, um, who it. Uh, Dorothy Mills tells us, um, uh, was a great Latin scholar. He did much to bring back a taste for good Latin instead of the medieval Latin of the schoolmen. You know, languages get, languages change, you know, over time. Um, our language has changed, right? We don't talk the same way Shakespeare talked. And a lot of people would say we're the worst for it. We don't the average person doesn't have as wide a vocabulary. We're not as careful with our words. Um, and this happened to Latin. You know, people weren't speaking Latin as their main language. Very few people just grew up with Latin as their first language. But everybody who went to school learned it. And I mean, learned it well enough to to be able to speak in it and um, and to read anything in Latin. But the things that were being written in Latin were less and less uh, 
like what had been written in the heyday of the Roman Empire. The same thing happened to Latin. It got, uh, you know, different vocabulary crept in and people started ignoring certain grammar rules like we're doing. And, uh, and so when they started discovering not only the Greek literature that came in from Constantinople, but they started finding manuscripts of Cicero and um, Ovid and Virgil and all these great Latin writers, people started looking at their Latin and saying, wow, this is so much better. We stink as writers <clears throat> compared to these guys. We really need to cultivate um, their style. And it's sort of like if there were a movement today for everyone to start writing literature in the style of Shakespeare or the King James Bible, which would have been about the same time. If we all decided that's much better English, decent educated people should write like that. That's what Petrarch did. Reviving classical Latin, okay. But the guy I really want to talk about is Dante. Dante did something crazy. And this was the next question I asked you. In what language did Dante write poetry? Oh, that should say his poetry. And why might that have been startling? He wrote in Italian. He wrote um, the poem that the high school students are reading right now. It's called The Divine Comedy. It's, it's an epic poem, and a lot of people would say it was the greatest thing written in the Middle Ages, and a lot of people would say it was the greatest thing ever written. And he wrote it in Italian because he wanted people to be able to read it. He didn't want people who hadn't been to school to learn Latin, he did not want them to be hindered from reading his poem. So he wrote in Italian, and people, he started in Latin, and then he, he decided to abandon that and start over in Italian. People said, Dante, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Anybody who writes serious literature, who wants to be taken seriously, is going to write in Latin. It's like, nope, writing in Italian. And he did a lot uh, for this push for people to write in their own languages. Um, less than 100 years later, Chaucer is going to be writing the Canterbury Tales. And he's going to be writing in English, not in Latin. A lot of people um, followed his lead. Um, all right. Last question I wrote to you, or I asked you, uh, was about a, um, how do we say, a military leader, a philosopher, a government official, and his name is Machiavelli. He was also from Florence. Machiavelli looked around and he saw that Italy was a mess. The problem with these Italian city-states was not that they were separate, was, it was that they constantly fought with each other. I mean treacherously. There was always some big battle. There were traitors going over to the other side. People were buying off the governments of another city-state so they could take control. The Pope was involved. The Holy Roman Emperor was involved. It was a mess. And Machiavelli said, look, that Italy, the city-states of Italy are flying apart from each other. And we're kind of sitting ducks, you know, if anyone wanted to take over all of us because we're divided, right? When you're united, you can stand firm against a threat. And when you're divided, they can pick you off one by one. Machiavelli said, we need a leader. And I asked you what kind of leader did Machiavelli think we, they needed. Um, here's quotes from Dorothy Mills. Machiavelli advocated a policy that would lead to political unity and military power. He advocated the dominance of a strong despotic master. Um, someone who would take control and do what was necessary. And I mean anything that is necessary. He wrote for one of the um, leaders of, of Italy, he wrote a book called The Prince. And it is notorious for being nasty, dirty politics. Can I go back just a moment? I just spotted on the floor something I was going to show you. Botticelli 
our artist, also did a portrait of Dante. This is the poet Dante. The red cap and gown are uh, the standard clothing of Florence. And the leaf crown is because he's a poet. So a portrait by Botticelli. He also is kind of looking, I don't know, looking down his nose, but he also has that kind of downturned nose. Maybe this was a Florentine trait. I don't know. All right. Sorry about that. Back to, back to Machiavelli. I want to read you a couple of quotes from the prince, and you will get an idea of why um, this, this book is sort of notorious for being uh, uh, wicked, I guess. Um, skip that one. Um, there is a general rule to be noted here. People should be either caressed or crushed. Either be super nice to your people or squish them. If you do them minor damage, they will get their revenge. If you hurt them, but you don't crush them. If you cripple them, there's nothing they can do. If you need to injure someone, do it in such a way that you do not have to fear their vengeance. Goodness. If you take over a city, you crush the opposition. You kill them. Don't just hurt them a little bit because they'll band together and come back for you. Crush them. Machiavelli also, um, here's more of his advice. He who becomes the ruler of a city that is used to living under its own law and does not knock it down, must be expected to be knocked down by it. Whenever it rebels, it will find strength in the language of liberty and will seek to restore its ancient constitution. Neither the passage of time nor good treatment will make its citizens forget their previous liberty. If you take over a city and they're used to being free under their own laws, squash it. If you let them continue to live under their own laws, if you let them be free in any capacity, they will remember their time of freedom and they will come for you. They will rebel, rebel against you. Um, he says, um, at this point, he's talking about more crushing. I do not intend to discuss in detail the rights and wrongs of such a policy. Is it right? Is it wrong? Don't care. So says Machiavelli. Do it. If you want to keep power, do it. If you want to keep the peace, do it. Don't ask yourself whether it's right or wrong. All right. Finally, if you take control of a state, you should make a list of all the crimes you have to commit and do them all at once. Do all the harm you must at one and the same time. That way the full extent of it will not be noticed and it will give least offense. One should do good, on the other hand, little by little so the people fully appreciate it. Whatever you have to do, whoever you have to kill when you take over, do it. <coughs> Excuse me. Do it in one fell swoop. And it'll be so huge people won't notice how huge it is. But if, you have to, if you're going to do good, do it little by little. So, oh, he did something else nice for us. Yay. So can you see why Machiavelli is is become a, a synonym? Uh, he's a, he's a uh, comparison for evil, wicked politics. We call such politics Machiavellian. You don't care whether it's right or wrong. You do what you have to do to, to maintain power and keep the peace, no matter what that is. Machiavellian. He is also Florentine. So next week, I would like you guys to finish, what are we doing? Finish chapter two. You're going to read about some re early reformers in Italy. You're going to read about many, many artists, like I said. And I'm going to be bringing in, it's too much to look at in one week, but I'm just going to bring in over the next, I don't know, four to six weeks, uh, representative samples of some of the artwork of these people. Some of them you're going to recognize their names, Leonardo da Vinci, probably. Um, some of them are going to be new to you. Uh, but we'll take a look at some um, some of the great artists of the Renaissance in Italy. Um, okay, so, so far we have finished chapter two in Dorothy Mills. We have um, 
introduction conclusion and add your um you know parallelism and simile and all of that to your papers all right last thing uh for next week you are finishing the hobbit uh i hate I absolutely hate that we have yet to be able to sit down and discuss The Hobbit, uh, where I can ask you questions, but hopefully we'll just do a lot of this um, next uh, next week. Um, I had these handouts for you, story charts, and we were going to talk about all the elements of fiction, um, but we'll, we'll try to keep with it. Um, last week, we talked about character. All stories have character, right? And, and uh, we talked about, uh, in particular, Bilbo, we talked about what he's like. Gandalf, what he's like. And Thorin, and a bit what he was like. As you continued reading The Hobbit this week, we saw changes, or not necessarily changes, but new information, perhaps, about each of these characters. Um, the first one I'd like to talk about is Gandalf. And actually, this was from last week's reading. Do you remember... Um, when they went to see Bjorn. Bjorn is the guy who can shapeshift and becomes a bear and lives on honey and has animals that serve him. And it's just all very odd. Uh, but he gave them tremendous help. He didn't believe them at first, right? He said, I'm gonna go check it out. I don't believe every, every stranger's tale. You guys sit tight, I'm gonna check it out. And he went and he found out, yes, indeed, they did kill the Goblin King their story is true. And he says, well, I like you even more now that I know it's true. And he gave them help. He gave them ponies to take them to the edge of Mirkwood. And uh, so, but anyway, do you remember how Gandalf handled Bjorn? He told the hobbits, this guy's a little touchy. He lives on the edge of the wilds. He doesn't live in a nice peaceful area anymore. There's goblins on one side, there's Mirkwood on the other side. He doesn't take any chances and he can be a little rough. So here's what we're going to do. You're going to come a couple at a time because if, you know, 14 of us show up uh, on his doorstep, he might lose his temper. You might remember some of the hobbits, uh, uh, well, some of the dwarves and, and Bilbo said, well, should we, should we even go to this guy? He's like, oh yeah, oh, yeah, I know how to handle him. What is Gandalf like with Bjorn? He's certainly clever, isn't he? He thinks of a way to manage someone who may not always be in the best mood. It's a little humorous what he does. Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, there might be more of us. I, I, I sh didn't mention, I didn't mention them. Oh, here they are now as they trickle in two by two. He also knows whom to trust. Gandalf is very wise. Just because on the surface, someone seems very rough, doesn't mean they're not going to be a trustworthy ally. Likewise, you know, just because someone seems okay on the outside doesn't mean they're going to be trustworthy. You see, you're going to see that in as we read the other three books as well. So remember that about Gandalf. He seems to be a good judge of character, the deep down character inside someone. Does that make sense? We also learn something about Thorin. In this week's reading, you, um, you read that Thorin was captured by, well, they were all captured by the Wood Elves, right? The Elves of Mirkwood um, are a different sort of elves than the ones in Rivendell, a little less friendly. Is it, does it make sense to you that they might be less friendly? Why? Do they not just throw open the doors to everyone who comes through Mirkwood, do you think? In Rivendell, they do. In Mirkwood, they don't. Why? Well, first of all, let, let's talk about setting 
a little bit here and how it reflects what's going on in a story. What's the setting of Rivendell? Rivendell is in a dell, right? A valley, it's peaceful, it's green, there's flowing water, there's green trees, it's happy, there's plenty of food, sunshine, they're playing out on the lawn at night. Remember they were playing outside and Bilbo woke up and they said, come, you know, come join us. And he said, no, I'm going to sleep some more. They live in an environment, a setting that's conducive to lightheartedness and happiness, and they don't have enemies nearby. What's in Mirkwood? First of all, enormous spiders. I mean, enough said right there. For some of us who are not spider fans, um, that's all I need to know. Huge spiders. Mirkwood. Murky. What does it mean for something to be murky? It's dark. It's shadowy. What happens in the dark and the shadows? Enemies can hide. Ambushes can be set up. The setting in which they live is not a safe place, is it? Not to mention, we are here, uh, you know, in the, well, the light is getting longer now, but we're in the roughly the darkest time of the year. We know how we feel. It's dark. It gets dark early. Dark atmosphere, dark settings tends to make people, oh, not frivolous and jolly and, 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 and partying like Rivendell. The Mirkwood elves are careful. You see how the setting in which they live reflects the type of beings they are. So <clears throat> they <clears throat> round up all the dwarves. Bilbo escapes, thanks to the ring, but slips in and lives there for a time. And the elf king asks Thorin, what are you doing here? And do you remember his answer? starving, which is true, because they've foolishly left the path, as Bjorn told them not to do. What, what, what were your friends doing? Starving. What are they doing now? Well, I expect starving. Then, then he says, what, what were you doing here in the first place? Thorin will not answer. Why? Why do you think? What are they doing there? They're on their way to get treasure back. Hmm. What might happen if everybody knew that they were going to get their treasure back? Maybe they might want some of it. Maybe the king of the wood elves might say, you know what? Yay for you, you've got your treasure back. Uh, I helped you on your way. Give me a share. What do we learn about Thorin's character? We may have mentioned this last week. I can't remember. Thorin is a bit on the greedy side. Thorin is possessive. He's not sharing that treasure with anybody. He's not giving anyone a claim on his treasure. Thorin could easily have said, look, we're sorry. We didn't mean to leave the path. We're on our way to our home. It's a legitimate errand. We're going to see if we can kill the dragon. Would you please let us go? All we want is to seek our own again. Could easily have done this at any time. But the minute he finds out from Bilbo that the rest of them are all in prison too, he tells them all, don't say anything about the treasure. Don't say anything. He wants it. Thorin's character is not always positive and appealing, I fear. Right. Last character we talked about last week, Bilbo. Bilbo. Bilbo is changing. We mentioned last week 
that he um, he uh, had the guts to approach the trolls. Got himself out of the goblin caves with the help of a magic ring, yes, but nonetheless. And um, and in a couple of places, uh, we're told that they start uh, the the dwarves start looking to him for guidance. Um, it says uh, this is after the spider episode, which we'll go back to in a minute. Um, <clears throat> But after a time, the light began to fail, and then other questions were asked. Where were they? And where was their path? And where was there any food? And what were they going to do next? <clears throat> These questions they asked over and over again, and it was from little Bilbo that they seemed to expect to get the answers. From which you can see that they had changed their opinion of Mr. Baggins very much, and had begun to have a great respect for him, as Gandalf had said they would. Indeed, they really expected him to think of some wonderful plan for helping them, and were not merely grumbling. They knew only too well that they would have soon all have been dead if it had not been for the Hobbit, and they thanked him many times. Some of them even got up and bowed right to the ground before him, though they fell over with the effort and could not get it on their legs again for some time. Uh, Bilbo saved their lives. They were going to be eaten by giant spiders. And Bilbo, um, using his handy dandy little sword that he got in the troll cave, fought them off. Somehow the killing of a giant spider, all alone, by himself, in the dark, without the help of the wizard or the dwarves or anyone else, made a great difference to Mr. Baggins. He felt a different person and much fiercer and bolder in spite of an empty stomach as he wiped his sword on the grass and put it back into its sheath. I will give you a name, he said to it, and I will call you Sting. I had hoped to be there with you. I promise I will bring this in, but I will show you anyway. Ha uh ha. -huh. Behold, Sting. Bilbo's blade with the elven runes in its sheath. All right, Sting. Um, I also have Glamdring. Um, so those of you who are watching this on Tuesday uh, who haven't seen it yet, uh, I will I will bring them to class so you can see it up close. But Sting. Bilbo has become a different person. That took side is growing and growing, isn't it? Um, and he is being relied on more and more. Um, when they, um, get captured by, uh, the Wood Elves and Bilbo is free, they say, oh, well, get us out. Are you going to get us out of here? Do you have a plan? When they do get out, they ride the barrels, you know, uh, Bil because Bilbo devised a plan. It's a very wet plan, not a very comfortable plan, but it's a plan. It gets them out. They get there. And it says, uh, it, 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 the book says, well, here we are, said Thorin, and I suppose we ought to thank our stars and Mr. Baggins. I am sure he has a right to expect it, though I wish he could have arranged a more comfortable journey. Still, all very much at your service once more, Mr. Baggins. No doubt we shall feel properly grateful when we are fed and recovered. In the meanwhile, what next? I suggest Lake Town, said Bilbo. What else is there? No, nothing else could, of course, be suggested. Bilbo decides the next move. Do you see Thorin? King of the dwarves, king of the, under the mountain, asks Bilbo what next. Bilbo is becoming a different hobbit. And the dwarves pay him respect for it. But he's paid for it, hasn't he? He's had to do some really, really hard things. Do you think that we can grow as people? Do we become braver or uh, more virtuous in any way without having to do some hard things? So I don't think it just comes to us automatically, does it? Um, Bilbo faced horrors. 
be stronger for it and he's more capable. Um, they, let me just look at my notes here. Yeah, they arrive in Lake Town, uh, as Bilbo had suggested. And um, here's the situation in Lake Town. Uh, other folks were far away, and some of the younger people in the town openly doubted the existence of any dragon in the mountain and laughed at the graybeards and gammers who said that they had seen him flying in the sky in their young days. That being so, it is not surprising that the guards were drinking and laughing by a fire in their hut and did not hear the noise of the unpacking of the dwarves or the footsteps of the four scouts. In Lake Town, they have forgotten, not forgotten, I guess that's different. They don't believe anymore that there's a dragon living to the north inside a mountain. He doesn't come out. We've never seen him. We, we don't know. We never saw it with our own eyes, so it's probably not true. Can you think of people today that maybe don't believe because they haven't seen? Can you think of what Jesus said about that? He said, blessed are you who have seen and believe, but blessed are those who not having seen, he tells Thomas, those who don't need to see to believe. And, and where was Lake Town getting its information? about the dragon from the old people. They didn't believe what their fathers and grandfathers, those before them, had to say. They don't think it's real anymore. It seems like a very realistic touch because I think there's a lot of people today that look like this, not about dragons living in mountains, but maybe about God maybe about the fruitful way to spend one's life, the way one should behave. People don't believe the old anymore. This happened at Lake Town. And so, but, but, but the master of Lake Town accepts them happily. Why? If, if he doesn't really think there's a dragon, why would he help them? The master hesitated and looked from one to the other. The Elven King, because there's an elf there saying, oh, these guys are prisoners of my master. The Elven King was very powerful in those parts, and the master wished for no enmity with him. Nor did he think much of old songs, giving his mind to trade and tolls and cargoes and gold, to which habit he owed his position. Others were of a different mind, however, and quickly the matter was settled without him. What kind of leader is the master? Uh, he looks around and says, well, which way is the wind blowing? What, what do people seem to want? Uh, okay, let's, let's go that direction. Not much of a leader at all. In fact, we hear that finally, you know, after they're there and they recover from their colds and things, the dwarves, uh, finally they say, um, uh, well, we need, uh, will you give us supplies? We're heading out to the mountain. For the first time, the master was surprised and a little frightened, and he wondered if Thorin was, after all, really a descendant of the old kings. He had never thought that the dwarves would actually dare to approach Smaug, but he believed they were frauds who would sooner or later be discovered and be turned out. He was wrong. Thorin, of course, was really the grandson of the king under the mountain, and there is no knowing what a dwarf will not dare and do for revenge or the recovery of his own. People who just kind of roll with the wind and don't really believe anything are quite shocked when they are confronted with truth or they're confronted with people who do believe something. They actually believe it. It's actually true. They don't know what to do. So I want you to finish The Hobbit this week. And next week, oh, I can't imagine that we will have another wave of some horrible weather. Uh, surely I will be seeing my Tuesday 
uh, people in person next week. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about um, conflicts, which I didn't really talk about um, uh, this week. I'd like to see if we can pick out what are the main ones, maybe if there is a main one. You can think about that as you read. Maybe jot down notes, note various conflicts and see if you can find maybe the most notable or important one for the story. And also a theme. Is there a, is there a, not a moral, not a lesson like an Aesop's fable, but a theme, something that is being explored. We've already touched on some of those. All right, I see that it is, um, we're an hour and a half in, it is 1030. I'm gonna sign off, uh, just like last week. Give me five, seven minutes or so. Um, why don't you be back in five minutes sort of waiting if you are a Latin student and um, you know, give me a chance to get some more tea and everything and I'll try to be back in, in five, six minutes or so. All right, the rest of you, have a wonderful week. Let me know if you have any questions and I hope to see you all next week and I will be bringing weapons. Bye guys.